Good morning. The first thing that's said there in that uh, bumper video is to rejoice. Rejoice. I feel like it's hard to rejoice. I feel like it's hard to do. I don't know what it is about joy. I, I don't know why it's so difficult to sometimes muster up evident signs of joy in my life. But it's difficult. It's challenging. It's almost like the world has conspired against joy and is just designed to choke out whatever joy and, and, and really feelings of happiness we might feel. I remember when I first got married, typically a time of joy for many. Uh, when I first got married, I uh, was working here at the church. Uh, still am, so good news there. Um, I was working at the church, would come home, would drive to our apartment that was down at uh, Deep Ellum, uh, sort of by Baylor Medical Center. And uh, on the way, something would happen. I'd be, I'd be happy at work. And then on my way home, I would kind of get used to being alone. The introvert would rise up in me and I would be happy. And, and, and then when I would get to my house, uh, I would, or my apartment, I would stand outside the door and I would hear my, my wife doing things inside the house. And I'd be like, okay, she's in there. She's expecting you to be happy husband. She's expecting you to be excited to see her when really what I wanted was an apartment to myself. Because, again, I, and, and what I didn't know was she didn't want me to come home because she was enjoying having the apartment to herself, too. <laughs> Communication's critical. But this goes on for me. Not every day, not even every week, but regularly I would stand at the doorstep of my home, even, even recently, hearing the kids play inside, what they call playing, what I call chaos, and trying to, to muster up inside of me, not like a desire to go in there, I love my family, but the desire to be what they need me to be, what I think they need me to be. And what I thought this was, was a restorer of order, a restorer of peace. And I completely lacked any kind of confidence to provide that. Lacked any kind of confidence. I, I, I don't know how I was gonna muster this up day in and day out and week in and week out. How am I supposed to do this every single day? And I think this is why we're not joyful. I think we lack confidence. I think joy and confidence are intimately related. I think when I'm confident, when I feel good about who I am and what I'm about, I am joyful. And when I don't feel good about it, I am not happy at all. And I think it's the same for everybody in this room. And if it's not, I'm sorry. But I think confidence and joy for us are intimately linked. And I think that's what this passage is gonna tell us about today. It's gonna be in Philippians chapter three, verses one through 11. And you're probably familiar with the passage. We're going to be there. We're going to talk about the relationship between joy and confidence. And then we're going to talk about where not to find confidence and then where we need to find confidence. So let's talk about this. And I want you to know something up front. Most of the time when, when you write a sermon, it should change you. And usually for me, it's some part, some quote, some portion of it that's really affected me in some way. I'm usually a minor change, minor course correction. I don't have like world altering moments every time I write a sermon. But this has changed my life straight up changed my life. And I don't say that um, loosely. Uh, not because it's something that I wrote, but because I think it's something that the Lord gave me when I needed it. So let's talk about joy coming from confidence. Verse one, finally, my brothers, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things to you is no trouble to me and is safe for you. So Paul says rejoice. And he's saying, it's not a burden for me to tell you again and 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 again to rejoice. In fact, he's told them five times already. He's used the word rejoice. He's gonna give the command again in chapter four and he's commanding it here as well, which we say Paul's commanding it. This is the word of God. So God is telling us today to rejoice, to be full of joy, to be people of joy. Now, here's the problem that many of us have. There is a disconnect between who we believe God is and this commandment. Because what we understand about Scripture, what we understand about ourselves, and what we understand about God is God is not a God of joy. We think he's a God that wants us to follow the rules, wants to stick to what we've been told to do, right? That's what many of us think. God is a God where you can be happy as long as you're following the rules. But if you're not going to follow the rules, then I don't want you to be happy. I want you to be miserable. So you'll feel bad about what you're doing. That's the image we have of him. But there's a problem with that image. Look at Leviticus chapter 23. If you brought your Bible, if you didn't, don't worry. I'll do the hard work for you. I got it. Chapter 23. Now, Leviticus is well known because if you've ever tried to read through the Bible in a year, Leviticus is the graveyard where that desire died. 
because it's a bunch of rules and a bunch of legal codes and a bunch of weird stuff. There's, there's, a, there's one in here about shaving your head and taking a vow, right? Some people have taken that vow, apparently. So 23, verse 39. On the 15th day of the seventh month, when you have gathered in the produce of the land, you shall celebrate the feast of the Lord seven days. Notice it says celebrate. They're going to have a rager for seven days. On the first day will be a solemn rest. Oh, Travis, there it is. See, he says solemn. Solemn means you're going to take this seriously. We're going to seriously party on the first day of the week. And then on the last day, the eighth day, will be another solemn rest. And you shall take on the first day the fruit of splendid trees, branches of palm trees and boughs of leafy trees and willows of the brook. And you shall rejoice before the Lord for how long? Seven days. You shall celebrate it as a feast to the Lord for seven days in the year. It is a statute forever throughout your generations. You shall celebrate it in the seventh month. You shall dwell in booths for seven days. All native Israelites shall dwell in booths, that your generations may know that I made the people of Israel dwell in booths. When I brought them out of the land of Egypt, I am the Lord your God, which basically means do it. And you may be like, okay, Travis, that's one week out of the year. Even my work gives me one week, one, one week off. Look at the rest of the chapter. If you've got convenient little headings like I do in your Bible... There's the Passover, which is a celebration of God's deliverance from Egypt. Then there's the Feast of Firstfruits, the Feast of Weeks, the Feast of Trumpets, and the Feast of Booths. There are four different feasts, celebrations that are commanded in Scripture. And if that's not enough for you, God commands them one day a week. You're just going to take the day off. You're going to rest. You're going to take a Sabbath. And that's going to be a time of serious joy. You're not going to be like the other nations. You're going to rest and relax. And you're going to remember me the whole time. And then if that's not enough for you, there's this cool thing they came up with that I think we should do called the year of Jubilee. Jubilee literally means joy. Every 50 years, we're going to take the whole year and we're just going to celebrate. It's going to be a big 50-year party every 50 years. And by the way, if you're enslaved during that, you get to go free and go back, back home. If you've sold property from your family's land, guess what? You get it back because that's what the year of Jubilee is all about. God is a God of joy, so much so that he legislates it. Can you imagine like our government being like, hey, we've decided we want to be a happy country, so we're, everybody's going to rejoice on this day. We'd all be like, what are they trying to pull? <laughs> I knew it. They're going to legalize something, or they're going to criminalize something. Right? Joy, God wants us to rejoice. He wants us to be celebrating him. God wants us to find our joy in him. He's supposed to be the source of our joy, the root of our joy, the object of our joy. Joy is supposed to revolve around him because he is a God of joy and he wants us to share in that with him. And here's why we're not joyful. Are you ready? Because we don't believe it. We have zero confidence in that promise from God. We have zero confidence that God actually wants us to be joyful. There's a word in German. I've learned it recently. It's super cool. Germans have cool words for things. And they say it cool, too. It's called Fernweh. Fernweh. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that correctly. But it's called farsickness. And it's this nostalgia for a place you've never been before. It's nostalgia for a place you've never been. So you might see a a travel poster or something on the internet. You're like, wow, I really want to go to that place. That place looks awesome. I want to go there. And you desire to be there, even though you've never been there before. A lot of people have uh, Fernway when they, when they see a movie or read a book and places like accurately described. Like I, I hear it a lot in, in uh, relation to Lord of the Rings. People want to go in the Shire and live in a hobbit hole, even though they've never been there before. Fernway. And a lot of us have Fernway for joy. We don't know if we've ever experienced it. We don't know if we've ever had it, but it sounds so good. And we think that if we have experienced it, we think it's something uh, that was a long time ago when we were a kid. It was like a Christmas that you got exactly what you wanted. And that was like the last time you remember joy. And now there is no joy. Everything's very serious. You think joy is not for you. Joy is for other people, right? Joy is for the wealthy because they can afford to be joyful. Or joy is for for the poor because they don't have to deal with all the things I've got to deal with. Joy is for the busy because they've got a full calendar, or joys for the, the people that don't have anything to do. Joys for the married, or joys for the single. Joys for the people with kids, joys for the people without kids. Joy is what for everybody else but me. And maybe you don't think you deserve joy. Maybe you don't think joy is for you because you're, you're a provider, and you're like, I've got to be serious. I've got to take everything seriously, because if I don't, then people are going to suffer. 
So joy is for everybody else, but not for me. Or maybe you think joy is not for you because your past is messed up. And you think, for God to want me to be joy, there's no way. Because I was joyful before, and I rejoiced in things that I shouldn't have been rejoicing in. And now i got to pay for it by being sad and regretful. Because that's what God wants me to do. He wants me to do penance for that. That's what God wants. Or maybe you think joy is not for you because life's not going the way you planned it to. You had a script in your head, I'm going to get this job, I'm going to get married, I'm going to have kids, I'm going to retire. And at some point, the script got derailed. So you think joy is not for you because it doesn't follow the script that you've been written or that you've written for yourself. Joy is not for you. We don't have confidence. We don't have confidence that joy is for us. But here's the thing. All of creation starts with joy. God makes everything and he pronounces it what? Good. Good means joyful. Not literally. But you can't have something that's good if it's not joyful, right? Like in this holistic, sort of beautiful, sinless sort of goodness, joy's got to be a part of it. Adam and Eve, they walked with God daily before the fall. It's not like they were nervous when God came around. They weren't afraid of him. It's not like they heard God coming and Adam was like, Eve, put on your best well, you're naked, so put on your best smile. We got, we got company. No. They were excited about God coming. It was only after the fall that they became nervous, that they became afraid, that they began to doubt whether or not God really wanted them to be happy, whether he wanted them to be joyful. See, here's what we believe. We believe that God holds out joy to us, and if we try to take it, if we believe for a half second that it's possible. He's gonna come over the top and smack us down because we think it's too good to be true. We think it's not real. And we think there's no way that God could be that kind. We're waiting for the other shoe to drop. We're waiting. God holds joy out as a trick. It's a trap to build us up and then smash us down so that he can rebuild us into whatever he wants to rebuild us. There's a word for that where you attribute and, uh, sorry, attribute and describe things to God that are not true about himself. It's called blasphemy. We all do it. We're all blasphemous. We all give, believe things about God that are not accurate. But this is one we hold very close to the vest because we don't want to be surprised. We don't want... It's better to be unhappy and safe than it is to be joyful and risked. We lack confidence that God wants us to rejoice. And so just like me, standing at the doorway of my home for years. You lack confidence. And so we stand right here at the doorway of the rest of this time together, the next 20 minutes, or the rest of your week, the rest of your life, and you can go on believing that God does not want you to be joyful. And you can continue on in your life and probably do okay. Or you can join me right now in prayer. And we're going to ask the Lord. We're going to say, Lord, for the next 20 minutes, I want you to stir in something in me that I will believe just for 20 minutes that you want me to be joyful and you're going to show me where to put my confidence so that I can have this joy that this guy's talking about. So let's pray. Ask him for confidence. Ask him for faith to believe just for 20 minutes. Lord God, you've commanded us throughout Scripture to be joyful, to rejoice, to celebrate. And you do not command what you do not provide. So God, I pray for the faith, the confidence, Lord, in you, not in ourselves, in you, to rejoice. Amen. All right, so when we lack confidence, we look for handholds. We look for places to put our confidence so we can feel secure, right? So let's talk about all the places we can't find Confidence. Where can I not find confidence? So what we're about to have is a very hard transition here in Scripture. Look at verse 2. Look out for the dogs. Look out for the evildoers. Look out for those who mutilate the flesh. For we are the circumcision who worship by the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. Okay, so Paul just said rejoice, and now he's like, watch out for the dogs. 
Now, he's not talking about your neighbor's pit bull. Some of these guys who would roll into town after he would plant a church, and they'd come in and say, oh, you follow Jesus? We follow Jesus too. But we follow Jesus, and we know something that Paul doesn't know, which is funny because Paul knows a lot. You need to become Jewish before you become a Christian. And gentlemen, that means a little surgery for you. It's called circumcision. Numbers in those churches, I'm sure, plummeted. And Paul's like, watch out for them. They're dogs. They're lying to you. They're evildoers. Now, here's what's weird. These guys aren't like going through the church and being like, well, I can't wait to sabotage the work of God in those churches. No, they're well-intentioned. They actually think they're doing what God wants them to do. They have put their confidence in the flesh. And they're like, surely God wants us to be obedient. He wants us to do these things. We can't just throw out some of these commands in the Old We can't do that. But Paul calls them evildoers. They're misguided. And Paul says, if you want to talk about having confidence in your flesh, if you want to talk about a resume, building a resume so that at night you can lay your head down and think you're a good person, and so other people think you're a good person, I have all the reason in the world. Look what he says in verse 4. Though I myself have reason for confidence in the flesh also, if anyone else thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. Okay, listen to his list. Circumcised on the eighth day. So when you were born into the Jewish faith, You were taken to the temple or the synagogue, and they circumcised you when they named you. So his parents were a good Jewish man and a good Jewish woman, and they took care of him. They raised him right. So he's like, I was raised right. Of the people of Israel. So he's not a convert. He's not a Gentile that became Jewish. He is full-blooded, as far as he knows, Jewish man. Of the tribe of Benjamin, which means his family could trace their, their lineage all the way through the exile, Back 400 years, he knew he was from the tribe of Benjamin. The tribe of Benjamin was significant. When the kingdom split after Solomon died, Judah and Benjamin stayed faithful to the the, the son of David, to Solomon's son. The other tribes didn't. And so Paul's saying, I was a part of the faithful tribes. I was the ones that stuck through it. I was a part of that group. And by the way, the first king of Israel, Saul, he was from the tribe of Benjamin, which is where Paul got his birth name from. He was named Saul. And so he says of himself, I'm a Hebrew of Hebrews. Basically, you can't get more Jewish than me, but I tried. He says, of the, of, according to the law, as to the law, a Pharisee, which means Paul took the toughest road possible. What are you going to be when you grow up, Paul? I'm going to be a Pharisee. Actually, it was Saul, but whatever. I'm going to be a Pharisee. They've got rules on top of rules, and I'm going to keep them. And this is what he says. Look what he says. As to zeal, a persecutor of the church. If you're not in line, if you're blaspheming, I'm going to come and get you. Then as to righteousness under the law, blameless. He's not saying he's sinless. He's saying that when it came to the code of the Pharisees, he did it right. He knew it all, and he did it right. And then look at his commentary. Look at what he comments on this. Verse 7. But whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Wow. All that work. That's like getting a PhD in something ridiculous and being like, nah, it's not really worth it. Paul says it's a total loss. What is it a loss of? Confidence. It's a loss of confidence before God. He did all this to be confident before the Lord. He did all this so God would like him. What's the law called? It's called the law of Moses. And he thought by following the law, he was gonna be like Moses, who was the good guy. Anybody got heroes in this room? Anybody, heroes? Nobody. Nobody looks up to anybody else in this room. Fantastic, okay. That also hurts me a little, just gonna be honest. I have heroes, I don't want to meet any of them. We all have people we look up to, right? Paul looked up to David. He looked up to Moses. He looked up to Daniel and Isaiah. These guys, he's like, I'm like them. I'm carrying on their tradition. And then Paul is assaulted visually and audibly on the road to Damascus. And for three days, he's blind. And Jesus says, why are you persecuting me? And you know what he finds out? He doesn't just find out that he's misguided. He doesn't find out that he's just a little off course. You know what he finds out? He finds out he's the bad guy. He finds out he's the enemy. He finds out he's the one that, that, all the, the, that was, would have been against the prophets. This is what he finds out. And normally it would crush you, right? How many of us are on the same path ourselves? Putting confidence in the flesh, thinking that what we're doing is the right thing to do. Building ourselves up. It's like we're all building this resume for ourselves and other people to read so that we can say we're a worthwhile person. We can have validation, right? And thereby have joy. We can be confident, we can have joy. 
If you want to know whether or not you do this, look at the way we raise our children. And I don't mean like specifically your children. Think about the ways that what we teach the next generation of people, right? We teach them to, because we all want our children, we want our next generation to be independent, to be self-assured. Nobody wants a kid to be insecure. Nobody wants a kid to struggle like that. We want our kids to be secure in who they are and who God's made them be, right? There should be vigorous head nodding at this point. If, if you're not vigorously head nodding, then maybe don't work in the children's area for a while. So what do we teach them? We teach them move into this neighborhood, get a good job when you grow up. So study hard so you can get a good job and you have lots of opportunities so you can live in the right neighborhood with the right people, invest in the right things and retire well and then repeat the process with the next generation. And what we're secretly telling our kids is that's where your confidence should be. If you're somewhere on that trajectory, then you can be confident that you're being a worthwhile individual. Now there's nothing wrong with that stuff until you get to tell somebody that is what makes you good or bad person. This is what makes you successful or not. We are desperately seeking confidence in who we perceive ourselves to be and who we want other people to perceive us to be. We're all building this resume. And it's why when people are critical of us, it's why we get so upset. Because the resume took a hit. Oh man, I'm not doing as well as I thought. It's why when we're stuck in the same job for years that we don't like and we get frustrated. Why? Because I'm not moving along the track. I'm not advancing. I'm not growing. I'm stuck. And so we're not happy. We're not joyful because we're losing confidence in ourselves. This is the problem. And the word of God comes rocking in like in verse 7. But whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. God is telling you today that if that's where your confidence in is, in who you are or who you perceive yourself to be rather, and what you're doing, what you're building for your future, if that's your confidence, it's a total loss. It's a waste of your time. Because when I, when I was standing on the doorstep, I read the books. I knew what I was supposed to be to be a good husband. I knew what I was supposed to be a good father. And I knew that when I wasn't able to do it out of my own desire, I'd try to fake it. Because in the army, they tell you fake it until you make it. And so I was like, that's what I got to do. And sometimes it would work well. But you know what happened a lot of the times? I would try to, again, trying to restore order, trying to maintain the peace in the family. So what I would do is I would, I would move the kids to like, okay, we've got to do dinner now. And then once dinner, okay, we've got to get everybody on to bath time. It's time for bath. And then once bath is over, okay, we've got to read story. And then once we get through the story, it's time to be everybody to, to be in the bed. And then my daughter would get up like five times to come tell me something. And I'm like, oh my gosh, you've got to be back in your room. I hope you're laughing because you've had that experience too. Because what I wanted was a couple hours of just sanity to myself. And so I was trying to fake it until I could get to this point because I had, and probably still have, no confidence in my ability to do that. So I was just trying to get through it, get through the window of time where I'm not confident so I can go back to my retreat where I'm at least safe, where I'm at least confident. So what do you do? What do you do if this is you? If you're, if you're somebody that's just wrapped up in, in, in insecurity and, and you don't have joy because you're not confident in, in what you're doing and you're just taking these hits left and right, what do you do? Well, the first thing you say is, what am I looking forward to today, this week in my life? What is it that I'm looking forward to? Because odds are that's where you're placing your joy. That's where you're having joy, which means if you can't get to that thing, then you won't be joyful. It means joy is fleeting because you're not gonna be happy. You're not gonna be rejoicing until you have that thing or you're in that time window, right? So I was looking forward to a quiet house each night. And if that didn't happen, I was frustrated. Then you ask yourself the next question. What happens if I don't get what I want? How am I going to respond? If I don't get that thing I'm looking forward to, there's nothing wrong with looking forward to stuff. But how do you act if you don't get that thing? Are you depressed? Are you angry? Are you frustrated? Are you irritated? That might be an indication that it's an idol. And then the last question is this. Am I so looking forward to this that I am absent in the present? I'm not engaged in what's going on in front of me. I am absent right now. If that's the case, then you are finding your confidence in this thing that's amorphous and out in the future, and it's not, maybe not gonna happen. And your confidence and your joy rests in a very tenuous place. Now, all this is diagnostic, so we need to find out what do we actually do? Where do we find our confidence? Obviously, we find our confidence in Jesus Christ. I, I think that's probably pretty obvious, but... Look at what Paul says, what that means for him. Verse eight, indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish 
in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith. So what Paul's saying is, knowing Jesus Christ or, or, or finding my confidence in Christ really boils down to two things, knowing Christ and finding a righteousness from God. So here's what happened to Paul. He found out he was the villain. He found out he was the bad guy. And what that meant for Paul, as, as, a, as a Hebrew of Hebrews, he was raised to believe that the Jews were the good guys and everybody else was going to get rocked by God at some future day of judgment. So the Romans were going to get rocked. The Greeks were going to get rocked. Persians, everybody was on the list. And now Paul finds out, oh my gosh, I'm on that list. I'm the bad guy. I'm with these guys now. But he also finds out something else. He finds out that God doesn't actually destroy his enemies. What he finds out is he sent his son to die for the sins of his enemies so that he can reconcile them, bring them back. And all Paul has to do, and he's blown away by this, is like, oh my gosh, you just mean I just have to trust? I just have to have confidence in this anymore and I've got to have confidence in the son of God, the one who like ambushed me on the road there? Done. That's why he counts all this as rubbish. Paul's in, he's like, this is great news. And now Paul's entire life is obsessed with getting to know this wild man from Palestine who claimed to be God and died and was raised again. Because he's like, if there is a God in the universe who has enemies and instead of obliterating them because he can, instead chooses to love them because he wants to and decides to reconcile them to himself by sacrificing that's a God worth knowing. That's a God worth pursuing. That is a God worth driving everything towards. And so Paul's obsessed. But here's the thing. You might be like, okay, Travis, I'm on board, but I have zero confidence that God wants to get to know me because you don't know what I'm like. And this is where the righteousness from God comes in because no longer do we have confidence in the flesh. We don't have to do things to get God to like us. We don't have to get God to, to be on our side. We don't have to be this perfectly well-behaved person. That's not what he asks of us. I mean, would he like for us to be perfect? Sure. But what he actually wants from us is our faith. He wants us to trust him. He wants us to love him. And when we screw up, when we fail, when we blow it, he wants us to come back to him and be like, God, I failed. I need more grace. And you know what he says? It's yours because that's why my son died for you. And you can believe that. You can have that confidence right now. If you've never had it before, you can be confident that God loves you and he died for you and he wants to draw close to you. You can have that confidence today. You don't have to live anymore in an unconfident life. And you can have this righteousness from God and then you can get set on this course of knowing him forever. Imagine that you won a vacation and the only stipulation of the vacation was that you could do nothing to prepare for it. You couldn't research, you couldn't pack, you couldn't do anything. My type A people in here are dying inside. All you had to do was put yourself on the plane. They would even come to your house and lay out your clothes for you. Now, let's assume that it's legit. Everybody would be like, oh, man, it's hard, but I want to do it. And if you did anything, you would lose it, right? Jesus today is extending a hand to you, and he's saying, I'm taking care of everything. Will you trust me? All you got to do is follow. All you got to do is come with me. Be confident in me, not in your abilities, not in the resume that you're building. And this leads to joy. This leads to joy. Because we start asking who in the world would do this. And we become obsessed with getting to know this God who would do this thing. You're not worried about what other people think about you as much. You're not worried about accomplishing things as much. Because there is only one accomplishment now. Knowing Christ Jesus. You find, realize your joy is finding, is getting to know him more and more. Look at verse 10. That I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible I may attain the resurrection from the dead. For Paul, getting to know Christ happens through two vehicles. Experiencing the power of God and sharing in his sufferings. Experiencing the power of God, sharing in his sufferings. Now obviously the word of God is important in the midst of that. You can only rightly interpret the experiences that you have in life, if you are reading the word of God or you're spending time in prayer, that's the only way through that. Otherwise, you'll come up with weird interpretations of what your life is doing. But if you're spending time in the word, you now can share in the power of Christ. Because what's gonna happen is the power of the resurrection, the, thing, the, the power that brought Jesus back from the dead now lives inside of you if you're a follower of Jesus through the power of the Holy Spirit. 
So now you walk into situations. Let's take me, for instance, standing on the doorstep of my household, ready to go in and be like, all right, time to restore order, whatever it is I'm going to do. Which, how condescending is that for my wife? Like, everything's, like, disordered. Now I go in and I say, I don't know if I have what it takes to be a good dad. I don't know if I have what it takes to be a good father. But here's what I do know. The Holy Spirit of God in me does. And I'm going to experience the power of God the moment I cross that threshold. Because he's going to show up. That doesn't mean I'm going to do everything perfectly. I might get frustrated. I might yell at my kids. Whatever. But I'm going to experience the power of God when I become convicted that I've yelled at kids, yelled at my wife. And I'm going to go apologize to them. And even though I failed, look at that. There's repentance and there's confession. And the power of the Spirit of God works in my life. And I get to know Jesus Christ better in that situation. Why? Because I learned he's a God of grace and forgiveness when my wife puts her arm around me and says, honey, I forgive you. Or when my kids say, daddy, I know. Like, it's okay. Or when they say, dad, you really hurt my feelings. Then I learn something. I learn that Jesus is working in me. And I ask for forgiveness. And then through the suffering, the sharing in the sufferings, many of us suffer needlessly. Because how did Jesus suffer? What did Jesus do to suffer? I'll tell you what he did. He suffered for other people. He sacrificed for other people. He gave up from himself to give to others. We don't suffer just for suffering's sake. We suffer for others. And we get to know Christ in the midst of that suffering because that's how he suffered. So when you're around people, what is that thing you're looking forward to? Whatever it is. For me, it was the end of the day, right? A couple hours to do what I want, watch a baseball game, whatever it is. Now I sacrifice from that time. And you know what I found out? I actually don't have to sacrifice that much. It's like five minutes. My daughter wants to come and tell me something. And rather than shooing her away back to her room, I sit and I listen. My daughter can talk, so sometimes eventually I do have to be like, okay, honey, seriously. A lot. But she just wants to be with me. Just like I want to be with Christ. Look, this is what has changed my life because now I've realized that when I show up to my house and when I show up anywhere, whether it's on this stage, in and amongst you, go into the grocery store. You know what I now bring with me? You know what I want to bring with me everywhere I go? It's not order. It's joy. Because I got to think, it was like, if Jesus were to show up at my house, my kids were going crazy, dinner's on the table, whatever, what would he bring? And I think it would be the most comforting thing in the world. And I think there would be so much joy. I think the Leviticus 23, Jesus Christ, would show up in my house and we would feast and we would celebrate. Because that's how everybody reacts to him in there. The only people that have a problem with Jesus are the people who are like Paul, who are confident in their own works. Today, today, you can have confidence. Today, you can have joy. Stop building the resume. There's nothing wrong with pursuit. There's nothing wrong with achievement. And there's nothing wrong with even being disappointed when you don't hit the mark. I get that. The problem is when we put a supreme joy. Because here's the thing. Only if my pursuit of Christ, only if growing in the knowledge of Jesus, experiencing Jesus, can I have joy all the time. Because guess what? If I fail, if I screw up, if I miss the mark, or if I hit it out of the park, I get to know more about who Jesus is in every situation. And if that's my goal, I win every time. So change your goal. Your goal in life, everybody in this room, I don't care what you do, your goal is to know Jesus more. And if you do that, if you make that your goal, you will sacrifice, you will experience power in your life, and your life will change, and you will be more confident than you've ever known, be more joyful than you've ever known. Joy and confidence are intimately linked. We lack confidence because we put it in ourselves. We put it in things that we do. And Christ says, put it in me. And I will show you something amazing and I will give you joy. Let's pray. Gracious God and Heavenly Father, thank you for the joy that we have in you. Thank you for the confidence that we get to stand before you and worship, to worry about being obliterated, to worry about being your enemy. Lord, I pray if there's people in this room that are imprisoned in a tomb of their own building, confidence, a tomb of confidence, It rises and falls with success and with approval. Lord God, I pray that you would, just like you broke out of your own tomb, I pray that you'd break them out of theirs. May it not hold them down. And may they enter into your joy, full of confidence, full of faith. 
it's in your son's great name we pray. Amen.